Hello and welcome to Roadmap 2023, our election issues and personalities tracking program. I'm Susan Illion, sitting in for Ladia Kiradolu Ale on this edition. Now, my guest says he has never and will never be interested in partisan politics, in spite of having been wooed severally to join the fray. My guest also says he is both for and against same religion presidential ticket. Roadmap 2023 talks to the Catholic Bishop of Sokoto Diocese, Dr. Matthew Hassan Kuka. Your Lord, thank you very much for having this sit down with us, especially during this critical time. Thank you very much. Thank you. You have been at the vanguard, if you will, of making a better Nigeria. Where do you think we are now? Do you feel a sense of success? Um, success, absolutely not. Um, Nigerians have done a great job of trying to stay together as a country, but um, leadership has not been our strong jacket. Um, immediately after independence, the first five years of Nigeria's independence, one great thing that the British did for us was that they gave us the infrastructure of a bureaucracy. And no country in the world can grow without an effective and an efficient bureaucracy. What Japan is today, what Britain is today, what America is today, what Singapore is today, all of that is tied to the quality of the service delivery structure, which is the bureaucracy. Now, the British left us a very pretty efficient bureaucracy with almost a clear sense of what it was to serve the public, what pub public service was all about. That stretched for just about five years before the tragic military coup of 15 January 1966 set a machinery in motion that destroyed the very foundation of the bureaucracy and subsequent infrastructure and the vision of a great Nigeria. That's where we took the wrong turn. Since then, everything has just been a question of stumbling and fumbling. When you look back as a priest, do you think that perhaps Nigerians have an unrealistic uh, expectation of leadership, that perhaps maybe they even deserve the leadership that they've had since the January 15, 1966 coup? Um, you know, we tend to blame the victim. The ordinary people of Nigeria have been the victims. Um, government at any point in time is a trust in which people take on behalf of the people. And um, so I will not blame ordinary Nigerians. Perhaps at another level, one thing you can blame Nigerians for is their incredible graciousness. The things that ordinary people even next door will not accept, mm -hmm. Nigerians have learned to accept. And guess what? This very intricate web of ethnicity, all the differences, have actually formed the kind of web that is responsible for what Nigerians call their sense of resilience. Because the kind of things that will trigger a revolt across any country, Nigerians have learned to live with it. I mean, there's no way, if you know the chaos going on now that has been going on for the last week or so over this whole currency problem, it would have been enough reason for people to burn down the infrastructure of power elsewhere. But Nigerians have remained hanging on the cross. Um, and we've learned to do that. For good or for bad, the good thing about it is that um, religion, culture, has both, they both created a mesh of tolerance and brotherhood. Um, and for me as a priest, all I can say is that I believe, and I'm not being you know, flippant here, that God in his own moment will still reward us for our graciousness because the people of Nigeria have been so tortured and so punished by their leadership. And yet they have not, you know, we've not flipped over. Because when you consider the amount of resources that God has placed at our disposal, I would not be angry as a priest as I am now 
were I to be unaware of the possibilities of what this country can be and how we've ended up with a bunch of human beings that have simply come to represent the story of Alibaba and the 40 thieves. So this thieving elite with almost no sense of morality or decency, of neighborliness, of goodness, of trust, and how to manage responsibilities, this is what we've been saddled with. Our only hope and prayer is that sooner than later, you know, um, things will happen differently. Um, we're only over 60 years as a country. The United States of America, how they developed democracies for over 100 years, are still battling with the same problem. But we have a greater sense of energy because we have the people, we have the education, and we have people who want a new Nigeria sooner rather than later. And you, you mentioned the January 15 coup um, over, that overthrew the First Republic in 1966. Now, they say hindsight is 2020. Do you feel there's, there's this perpetual nostalgia that I find Nigerians feel when they change regimes, they get very excited about change, and then they always seem to wish for the previous um, president. I know that that happened with um, Dr. Goodluck. Jonathan, the former president. People were happy for a change, and now they, they're nostalgic about how it was back then. There's this perpetual presence of this type of nostalgia for past presidencies. I think what it is is, uh, I always say to people as a priest that the solution to a bad marriage is not a new marriage. It's often an attempt to look at what has gone wrong. Um, and if you jump to a new marriage very quickly, after some time you become nostalgic about the first marriage. So if, metaphorically, you can say the same thing about Nigeria. It is that a lot of these changes that we have seen in Nigeria are largely unprogrammed. If you go back to even 1966, and you can run through the entire history of who has been prime minister, who has been president, who has been, whether through a military coup, there has, there has been no linearity, if I may use that expression. There's been nothing linear in the sense that military coups by themselves that stretch over a 20-year period we are just glorified banditry and arm robbery because you pulled a gun and you became head of state. And almost up till today, very few Nigerian presidents have come prepared for the job. If I take you back, we have President Buhari now. President Buhari already in 2011 had said, I don't want to be president again, I'm tired. He was literally pulled out screaming to be president in 2015. He took over from Jonathan. Jonathan himself, you know the circumstances that brought him to power. Yaradua, before him, Yaradua was already saying, I'm done, I want to go back to teach in the university. Uh, before Yaradua was Obasanjo. Obasanjo was in prison, hoping that one day he'll walk out of prison, and if he's strong enough, he'll go back to his farm. And you can go on and on and on. You know, Abdul Salam was about to be retired from the military when Abacha died and he became head of state. You know, Abacha, you can go all the way down in Nigeria, you're not going to find one single person who has been president or head of state of Nigeria that came prepared for the job. That's where, if we are to return to the scene of the crime, that's where you have to go back to. That we have not had a leadership that is the result of individuals sitting down and thinking and planning and understanding the problems of Nigeria and figuring out why we don't have electricity and figuring out why we don't have rules and figuring out why are we so chaotic. That is away from the shadows of governance and politics, just thinking through whether it's by way of a retreat. If you came through with seminars and conferences and then you finally have a, an aggregate of answers and possible suggestions, with the database of people who have the ability, people you can call on to, to do X, Y, then you'll be talking about a government that can have results. Right now, you see the cowboys, everybody's running around. The president will be elected. Then the funders will come. The bandits who put the money down will come and tell you, my man has to be minister of this, my man has to be minister of that. Every state in Nigeria has to produce a minister, and it is at the behest, not of the president, but of the governor of the state. So, so this is the convoluted environment that produces the toxic thing that we call governance in Nigeria. And if you ask how we got to be where we are, this is the hand that fate has dealt us. So how we walk through this and begin a process in which people really and truly prepare for public office, that's where we will begin to count. As opposed to presidency by default. 
presidency, I call it presidency by, you know, by parachutes. People just come from, you know, wherever. And um, it's, that's why there are other ideological questions as to whether this four by two, that is four years and four years, is what is going to work for us. We don't know. But the truth of the matter is that the average person is going to spend hundreds of billions of naira to get into power. It's not their own money. They would have taken money from left, right, and center. And then the first two years they have to spend paying, making sure that those who funded them get back their money. Then by the third year, they have to start stealing money in order to be able to contest the next elections. And then by the time they contest the next elections, they're going to start stealing money to make sure that they, their man succeeds them. This is the kind of situation that we have on the ground. Now, how are we going to work out of it? It's a matter of a little bit of political science, but also people beginning to think a little bit more clearly about options. And we are seeing a lot of that beginning to, 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 to coalesce with the energy of the young people who are now not looking at an opportunity that governance simply means stealing money for myself, my children, and my family, and so on and so forth. This blind appropriation, this immoral, irresponsible instincts of acquisition, that we are gradually seeing a slightly different template. It's not an open door yet. But younger people, was the, they bring in their energy and have, are carrying perhaps less burden than they have their predecessors. Then we can begin to make choices that are based on people willing to volunteer, people willing to sacrifice, people willing to invest on integrity, people who are also asking questions and saying, why are you at the door? Can you tell us what we, have, we can see from the antecedents that suggests to us that if you became our president, we will be better off. Those are the critical questions that we never really were asking before because we had leaders being imposed on us. We are not out of that yet, but my argument is that in the next two or three or so elections and with improvement in the electoral system, we probably will get to a point in which we can elect people we are convinced need to be you know, at the, at the seat of government. I want to ask you your view of the upcoming elections, but from two perspectives. One is uh, the convener of the National Peace Committee, uh, someone who's really pioneered nonviolent behavior. How has that um, affected the mudslinging in this um, campaign right now? And the second is from your personal position as a, as a cleric. What are your congregates saying? Are they invested? Have they collected their PVCs? Uh, are they going to vote? What are their fears, if any? Well, let's start from the last, uh, from the end of your question as to whether ordinary people have, uh, whether they've collected their PVCs. Actually, we should be looking at elite irresponsibility, which is what is responsible for the problems we have. Because the, the elites who are asking these questions are not going to be the ones who will go out to vote. The elites don't go out in the rain. The elites don't go out when the sun is, is, is hot. The elites have certain behaviors. They might be sitting down on Saturday morning watching Tiger Woods. Or they might be sitting down just watching football. The elites don't have first to risk. The ordinary people you are harassing as to whether they've collected their PVCs, thank you, they did that long time ago. The challenge and the question is that this system has never always rewarded them by their outcomes. Through the manipulation of the processes, through the anger that is generated from their investing emotionally and psychologically and physically and reaping absolutely nothing. And all they are getting in return is that those whom they have suffered to vote for are often hijacked by the elite who are sitting in the comfort of their room and drinking their brandy. They will be the first people to arrive to organize parties for the government that has come to power. They will be the ones who will get the contracts. They will be the ones who probably invested under the table. So if you talk about ordinary people, the ordinary people of Nigeria deserve to be credited because in spite of they continue to go out to vote, not because of what government has done for them, but in spite of being abandoned by government. So if you ask, have they gotten their PVC? They've gotten their PVC. But would that necessarily correlate with the behavior of the institutions that are responsible for delivering on the, on the, on the results of the election? Those are the critical issues. The second point about violence, it is that violence is actually consequential. It's not the result of, of ordinary people doing bad things. Violence derives from the frustration of people seeing very clearly their wishes being overturned. Violence is a product of 
people investing and seeing that their commonwealth is being shared out day in and day out by an irresponsible leadership at a national and subnational levels. Violence is produced by ordinary people who cannot understand through no fault of their own. Is it my fault that my brother is not a local government chairman? Is it my fault that my brother is not the governor? Is it my fault that my sister is not a senator? Because people are seeing every day the difference in the quality of your life, the difference in the infrastructure in your village, the difference in the infrastructure around your, your relations. When you become a local government chairman, when you become a senator, they can see the, 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 the measurable changes that are taking place. So a tale of two cities emerged in Nigeria a very long time ago. So if you ask, it is that we have to just thank the ordinary people of Nigeria for riding on this road to Golgotha and getting almost, as I said, next to nothing in return. But we still do the things that, you know, that we need to do. And this is why happily, because we are Christians and we are Muslims, and because we don't, we, even if we don't trust these people, we trust that something superior to them will more or less, let me put it that way, take care of business. So I, I believe that sooner than later, ordinary people of Nigeria will be rewarded and they will see that democracy is a functional uh, system of government that can deliver and take us away from this chaotic environment in which the political elite continue to manipulate our identities, whether it's as Christians or as Muslims, and so on and so forth, to their own advantage. So Nigerians believe in a democracy, uh, not the type they have, but they believe in the superior ideals of democracy. And as I said, I continue to encourage our people, let's remain on this road, because there is no alternative. The military has demonstrated to us its lack of capacity to deliver us from our problems. So nobody should ever, by any stretch of the imagination, contemplate a military solution to our problems. They have shown us over 20 years or 30 years that all we can get from them is violence and more violence and corruption. So democracy, with all its structural weaknesses, Churchill said it a long time ago, is the worst form of government except for others. So it's not a perfect system because human beings are not perfect. But we believe that if we remain on this road long enough, um, our fortunes will change. I want to know about, have you heard any interesting perspectives coming out of the uh, contestants, the candidates right now? Well, I, luckily for me, I'm a very lucky Nigerian because uh, all, most of the contestants are people that are known to me. Uh, they are people that I've spoken to. They are people I've known for more than 20 years. So none of them is a stranger to me. Uh, as to the level of believability, I think I hear, you know, some really deliberate effort, you know, to, to, to speak about the issues of Nigeria quite differently. Um, I am also impressed by the quality of issues that are being raised. I'm also not hearing conversations about grand delusions of what we will do for you, but there is deliberate effort, even from the point of view of input of civil society and other non-state actors. There is a, a qualitative effort to inject more into the conversation. Um, and I think that that has improved the quality of, of the conversation. But I'm actually not even concerned about what we are hearing now. Uh, this is a period of courtship. Okay? It's courtship. Marriage will be after May 29 when a new president is elected. And it is then that we must do what we have never done in Nigeria. That is develop the strategy and structures for expressing our anger. So we should keep records of all the promises these characters are making, because they are making promises they don't intend to keep. All right? They are making promises that if you let them, they will get away with them. So one of the things that we haven't done in Nigerian democracy effectively and efficiently is to find a way of channeling our anger and insisting that this nonsense cannot continue. So if Peter Obi is elected president, if uh, Bola Tinubu is elected president, if Kwan Kwaso, if he's still in the race, is elected president, if Atiku is elected president, anybody, show sure, anybody who is elected president, we must have the capacity to say, this is not a friendship club. Can you deliver on this, on this, that, and the other? So the lack of engagement in Nigeria after election 
is what has brought us to where we are. We wait for the National Assembly to decide whether they're going to impeach a president or they will not impeach, whether they're going to impeach a governor or they won't impeach. Guess what? You can impeach on the streets. Okay, you can impeach on the streets. So Nigerians must learn vigorously how to confront the evil that stares us in the face. So for me, the, the promises they are making, these are the easy things, but we must be ready to take advantage of the promises they are making and from May 30th, begin a process of engagement that forces the hands of those who have elected to fulfill their promises. To hold them accountable. Abs well, yes, to hold them accountable. To hold them accountable. But you know, when we use the words holding them accountable, many of us think about it in terms of financial accounts. Okay, I mean, <laughs> accountability is not just about really now figures. You know, whenever on a good day, the, the media, all kinds of people can help you pretend that you've you fulfill what you've promised. But guess what? Accountability is not even about the roads we've constructed. It's not about uh, uh, you know, the things you have done. There are also other moral issues. Because if you have a situation where a man is making his children, his uh, wives, his uh, uncles, the contractors to execute these same projects, there are problems with that. So the accountability is a much more broader way of looking at this whole system. But it's also about more, what more, most Nigerians are looking for. It's not jobs. Only 42 people are going to be ministers. All right? Only 36 people are going to be governor. Only one person is going to be president. What happened to the rest of us? We just want you to create a condition in which if I am just, if a woman is by the, road of the, by the side of the road, and all she's doing is just frying a kara and selling, that she can do that with dignity and undisturbed. So there is a dysfunctional approach to development in Africa and in Nigeria, in part because the oil wells are there. People are just fetching the oil. They've been fetching it for 60-something years. All that a president of Nigeria does or the governors do. Why will anybody not want to be president? People complain, why is politics violent in Nigeria? Politics must be violent in Nigeria. There's nowhere in the world where you can govern so irresponsibly and get away with it like Nigeria. Like a man comes at the end of a month. A governor has planted a commissioner who may be his relation or his boy. He comes at the end of the month, collects a check, 50 billion, 60 billion. The people don't see the money. Nobody knows where the money is kept. It is spent on their behalf. How it is spent, we don't know. We don't have a right to ask questions. You are president of Nigeria. You can make an individual a billionaire in a question of hours and minutes. You can't get away with any of this anywhere. We are hearing other things happening in other climes. So this is where Perhaps the uncompleted text about changing color of money and becoming making cash less is the right way. We may not be there yet, but I can see where these guys are going. Because until you take hard cash off the table, you're not going to begin to deal. Of course, criminality will continue in cyberspace and all that, but still, it will not be as vulgar as the kind of things we have in Nigeria. So there are. Changes need to be happening in other departments, you know. And this is why if you create an environment where young engineers, where young people who are roaring to go can have the space, because the beauty of democracy is that the frontiers of freedom are unlimited. Tyranny and dictatorship circumscribes your freedom. And freedom is not freedom to be responsible, but freedom to explore without anybody putting a check, you know, a wall in front of you. So for me, these are some of the issues. We are not expecting that the president of Nigeria will be just, you know, suddenly turn the country. It's not going to happen. Presidents, governance is a way of holding together dreams and visions. Um, and if they tell you today that, God forbid, uh, Dangote uh, has a serious headache, and that um, he's gone to London for. We'll be standing in better breath because Dangote is a fundamental part of the Nigerian economy. All right, in the same way that uh, if they tell you that the ambulance is standing in the house of Mark Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg, hey, something will change. So the question is how to get our people to take their eyes away from that single door leading to a place called Asorok, 
to realize other windows that are around where people can function effectively and effectively. For me, this, this is the essence of governance. Could it be that Nigerians' expectations are unrealistic? No, the expectations are not unrealistic. But look, it's like, okay, imagine a brother of mine or some, somebody from my village arrives at Abuja and he gets a job as a driver or as a houseboy or as a house girl and he got a wife with three children. Maybe the master he is serving has got only a wife and a child, but he's got a wife and three children. Will his children be wrong to ask him, Daddy, why is our house not like the house of the master? Will they be wrong to ask, Daddy, why don't we have a car? Now, the point I'm making, you see, we shouldn't be focusing on what government can do. We should be focusing on what will government, how will government create an environment for me to be able to do what I need to do. And this is the point I'm making, that this endless look at one window simply increases the length and breadth of the corruption. Because the reason why everybody wants their friend or their uncle to be president, it is important to the Yorubas if a Yoruba man is president. It is important to the Igbos if a Igbo man is, is president. It is important to the, you know, to the Fulanis. The Fulani man is important. But guess what? A lot of these are just beyond the emotions. President Buhari has been president. It has not made that many Fulanis rich people. Okay? You can see the reactions to his visit to many parts of northern Nigeria. All right? I saw a, a, a video the other day of a man who, from Katsina, is from a village in Katsina, who decided to, uh, uh, to call a party, and he slaughtered a ram. And he said that when Buhari was elected, he named his son Buhari, but he's now calling people back because of his disenchantment. He now wants to rename his son, you know, by a different name altogether. So, you know, it's an illusion that Nigerians think that where the president comes from is important. But this illusion is born out of their own practical experience. Because today, if you live here now and go to the villa, how you dress, how you speak, will determine where you move around. Yesterday it was like that. The day before it was like that. But does all this deliver you know, to the broad segment of people? It doesn't. So really, the point I'm making is that Nigerians, if Nigerians say they've been disappointed with their leadership, they are right. But again, it is we, we do not go out, we don't go to elect a president so that he will build schools for us. Or so that he will build it was not just about the infrastructure, because like I've said severally, if it was if government was just about the delivery of infrastructure, then Hitler could have been canonized in Germany because the infrastructure that Hitler left made Germany the best developed country in Europe. So we are not talking about people who are, if it is that, we shouldn't have fought against apartheid because apartheid left the best infrastructure in South Africa. Okay, uh, Paul Kagame, about whom you are talking, has done great work and everybody is telling you about how wonderful Rwanda looks, at least physically, how good we are, but in exchange for what? So the issues are a bit more complex. I'm still making the same point that a government's business, that is why the Obasanjo administration did exceptionally well when he set up this small scale, Smidan, as it is called. But as it is with everything in Nigeria, it's never been sufficiently funded well enough to allow businesses to spread across the length and breadth of this country. Because in a third world country like ours, whenever you create a bureaucracy, you create a pool of corruption. So services are never really delivered. So for me, I still repeat, we are not looking for a president of Nigeria who will take responsibility for building X, Y, Z. No, we are still looking for a president of Nigeria who will create conditions that facilitate those who want to build the towers, the 20 uh, block towers, let them go ahead. But the small person who wants to just do this little thing for themselves, let them also, let everybody be. For me, that is what it's all about. It's what policing is all about. It's what infrastructure is all about. It's what all kinds of range of government services are all about. So we have almost a total collapse of some of the infrastructure that are on the ground because public service has collapsed so badly. 
So people, everybody you put now, most people you put in positions of power are just, they've just, you've just offered them a place to do well for themselves. We have a Muslim Muslim ticket in this current election and it kind of breaks with tradition. Uh, some candidates do see it as a rite of passage to have one candidate from one religion and their running mate representing a different religion. How does that translate into better roads, better health care? Why is it so important? I don't know it's important because we're Nigerians. First of all, the citizenship of the candidates is in suspended animation. It's as if, and it's a trade-off. I mean, a Nigerian who happens to be a Muslim or a Muslim who happens to be a Nigerian. I mean, in, in, it, it, it's crazy, but that's the reality. And we are not now, people will be disappointed. A lot of people have been, they keep saying to me, Bishop Kuka, tell us, where do you stand on this Muslim-Muslim ticket? In fairness to the Christian community, in fairness, when Buhari came, December 31st, 1983, in 80, he took Tunde Idiabo, a Muslim from Northern Nigeria. Let me use the word, the Christian community, we live with that. In fairness to, I'm a Christian and I come from Northern Nigeria, if you're going to use that category of identity, we have sacrificed in measurable terms. Then we had the elections in 1993. Uh, what's his name? Um, Abiola took Kingibe from Borno. We voted. Let's return to the scene of the crime. Why have Nigerians begun to feel that religion matters? Where religion matters, not because we thought it mattered, but this government in particular has made us become conscious of religion and religious identity. So let's not deceive ourselves. Are you going to tell me that I shouldn't be nervous? There is a saying in Hausa that if you have been burnt by fire, if you see ashes, you will run. So Ahmed Dati, for example, I give you an example. He owns Bayes University. He's a Muslim. Dr. Dati calls me up one day, and he's always invited me to come for the convocation to the office of his uh, university. But one day he calls me up. He said, Bishop, I'm building a university in Kano. I would like you to give me the name of a priest, a Catholic priest, that I want on the board of trustees. <laughs> he's a Muslim. I served for six years with at the American University in Yola. Didn't I think know I was a bishop? Um, so, you know, as I said, I feel sad that we have to make this case. But this government has so privileged Islamic identity and northern and regional identity. This is what has produced all this. And I worry because I cannot understand how President Buhari would have pretended or assumed that he didn't see this coming. Or because he's complicit. Let me, because as President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria and his government being in power, he cannot say that he was unaware. It would be, it would, you know, it would be a pity. Because I can give you one example. When there was, there were so many people who wanted to be president. I went to President uh, uh, Obasanjo. Say then was. And I said, look, so many people are coming out to, 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 to run for office. Why are, you, why are you just letting things go? And, you know, we talked about it, but one thing of, I knew Obasanjo once mentioned in a conversation was, look, we need to create a sense of belonging across this country. And his argument, and that was the argument that brought Jonathan, was that if we move around, we move, let every community get a sense that their man or their woman has been there. It will not solve all their problems, but will achieve an equilibrium, an emotional equilibrium, which people now say, okay, either we also, our own son has been part of the bandit club, so we are no longer innocent, but at least let's create that impression. Now, if Buhari has run this government in a way, and I've been one of his critics, he publicly admitted that, because I said, we've never had a situation in this country where you say, the Senate president, the, the, the majority leader in the Senate, the speaker, the, 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 the deputy speaker, they are all Muslims, and it doesn't matter to you. Or that the entire service chiefs, bar one, are all Muslims, 
and people are stupid, we don't know what is happening, and that you've taken people out of retirement and given them the most critical positions in this country, and the way the shenanigans that went on in the Supreme Court, are we stupid? We don't know what is happening. So Christians are genuinely angry and feel betrayed. And those who were his closest aides in the Christian community, beginning with his former secretary to government, have decided we want out. We, this is not what we bargain for. So if you are asking me about Muslim Muslim ticket, Tinubu will probably say, what did, I, what, what did I do that is different? After all, I've taken Shetima, who is from Borno. You voted for Abiola and uh, Kingibe. They were all from Borno. We have repeated the same thing. In my view as a Christian, and I tell my Christian brothers, I feel proud that we have put this country first before regional or religious feelings. And we must not feel inadequate or, in, or you know, simply because we took this decision. It's a moral decision. I live in northern Nigeria. It is not enough that my northern brothers often tend to say, hey, but see the way that Buhari has treated us, we do have it. That's not the point. It's not the point. The point is, how do you spell equity? How do you spell fairness? So if people are now saying Muslim, Muslim ticket, it's not because Christians are hoping to get a better deal. I don't believe that if Ashwa Jutinubu and Chetima become president and vice president, the country will change in any dramatic way in favor of anybody. I believe that a lot of Christians will still do business and get business done. But where we are now, we are reaping the seeds that were sown in 2015, with the beginning of all this uneven, distorted, and in my view, a reprehensible way of managing diversity. This is why we've, otherwise, identity politics is toxic if it's not well managed. And before then, before now, we, we didn't really have a problem with all of this. So this is why you find people having this kind of emotional, but, I don't want to get sucked into that because, one, I know better that in the final analysis, the government or the president of Nigeria who will do well for us will not be based on gender, will not be based on religion, will not be based on religion. I know for sure that the earlier we bring closure to the ugly things that have happened in the last eight years, the better it is for us in terms of building. But I can tell you this government only made managing identity far more difficult and far more challenging. And that's what we are saying. So for me, the, 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 the sentiments expressed, I'm saying two things. Maybe I'm equivocating. They are valid, but they are also invalid. Valid because the condition has been created. Invalid because they are really never determinants of outcomes. But this is the hand that fate has dealt us. So I, I am convinced that Christians should do what Christians ought to do, vote in conscience, um, and that ethnicity and region they are valid emotions and ethnicity. They are valid emotions, but they may be sufficient. They may be necessary, but they are not a sufficient condition for determining how this country is going to go. You've been known um, to say that Nigerians are very religious, and it seems obvious that there's a religion plays a big role in Nigerians' lives. Has it translated to a more just society, to a more caring culture in the country? this religiosity? Let's, you know, I'm a student of religion. My PhD thesis was on religion and politics. And my brothers in northern Nigeria, when they don't want to listen to what I'm saying, they fall back to, ah, you know, you are attacking Islam. Yeah. There's a difference between Islam and Muslims. Yeah. There's a difference between Christians and Christianity. Yes. My interest has been on Muslims. Okay, and the manipulation of religion, and the immoral manipulation of religion for political ends. Because a lot of these characters, beyond using the religion as a vehicle to ascend to power, they couldn't be bothered. And that is the danger. It's a danger for the religion, whether it's Islam or Christianity, or whether it is ethnicity, because the instrumentality of any identity creates, that's the story of Rwanda, is the story of Germany, is the story of, you know, it, it, so it, these are not new things. Northerners must ask themselves, I say this openly, I'm a scholar. People must ask, does it make sense that, what does it say of Islam, that after all is said and done, we've become the most violent part of this country? How, does, how, do, you, how do you explain that? We have realized that going to bed with political power is a danger to faith. And any religion that cannot stand on its own 
Any religion that whets its appetite before the throne of power, it doesn't matter how friendly that president or governor may be, dilutes the religion and lays the foundation for the destruction of that religion. Because Christianity, religion was never meant to be, as I said, a vehicle for propelling. Of course, we've, there have been Christian empires, Muslim empires, but how did they end? So those of my brothers and sisters across this country who are worried, and because this feeds into whether a president is Christian or Muslim, because we are hoping that if a president is Christian, then more Christians will have opportunities, they will go to Jerusalem, if we have a Muslim, more Muslims will have all these opportunities. But by the way, I don't know how many of my Christian brothers know that it was actually General Abacha, a Muslim, who gave us the Christian pilgrim's <laughs> board. But has it made us better people? No. This is what I call the pilgrimage, is what I call the bureaucratization and subordination of religion by the powers of the state. So the presidents and the governors, I just, and I, I've heard this, you know, people just, oh, we are sending you to Mecca, to Jerusalem, go and pray for us. This leads into my next question. So, Some states are secular, yet here we, uh, the government sponsors pilgrimages. Uh, the children are in school do opening and closing prayers. Uh, there are blessings and endorsements by religious leaders towards politicians. How above the fray are no, the religious no, they, leaders, no, or are the they point, extensions? No, from the, from the point of view of prayer, public prayer, no, those, those are givings. In terms of those are givings, I'm talking about what I call the instrumentalization. That is when this identity, whether religion or ethnicity or religion becomes an instrument. It, they, 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 there is a difference between secularism of the state and the secularity of the state. Secularism yeah. is when you decide that you don't want to have anything to do with religion at all, at all. The, the Soviet Union tried it, it collapsed. China has tried it, it's really not working. They're just using all kinds of means of brutality to hold it down. So you cannot, if you are in school, that doesn't mean, but there are other things that even, I don't know whether they should be part of our conversation, but it is that every school, for example, in, and I've had to approach government for this, the federal universities and federal institutions, even state institutions, where people congregate, it ought to be, because in our constitution, the, the law, that people, Catholics, Protestants, Muslims, whatever, people should be able to provide places for their prayer should be provided. Whether they are built by the university or built by themselves, that's a different thing altogether. Now, it is different from, because when you instrumentalize religion, it becomes the basis by which certain favors come to you. All right? Is that what's happening right now? Well, no, so what I'm saying, <laughs> I, no, what I'm saying in effect is that that is religion as a default. Right. Okay, and it's religion at the realm of politics. And that kind of religion, when you, like somebody said, you cannot go to a party organized by cannibals. You show up there and then you say you don't eat human flesh. Okay, it doesn't work that way. If you politicize religion by getting into politics and getting into a political fray, then you face the contamination. So I'm saying that, and I can use myself as an example, not because, despite my own imperfections, I've had, I've mixed with all kinds of people from top to bottom. People have offered to me, so you should come and be a senator. Can you imagine yourself as a Senate president? And one day, you know, President Obasanjo and I were chatting, and he was, we, we always talk, and he said something to me about, um, uh, I've forgotten, was about being president. I, I was in the villa, and I was having a cup of coffee, and he appeared, and he said, how would you be drinking coffee in my place without, and I'm not, I'm the president. I said, sir, this is public, this is our public house, it's not, it's not for you. You just happened to be here. I could be here tomorrow. He said, okay, would you like to be president? I said, no, no, no. If you offer presidency of Nigeria to me, I will sue you for defamation. Because my priesthood, no. What am I doing with presidency of Nigeria? People have said to me, come and be governor, we will pay. But I'm like, this priesthood is all dear to me. I cannot trade you for anything in the world. Because, what? because I'm looking for what? If it is a, as a result of trying to do good, it's an illusion because I've studied enough politics and religion to know that we are I to go and become governor or president today. Okay, so people gather, and the first appointments we are making, and I'm saying, look, we will make sure that we're not going to have to give out contracts. This is how we're going to spend money so that ordinary people, the first thing they will tell me is, Bishop, this is not church, this is politics. We are in politics, not Catholic church. So this is how it is done. 
And they will be right because it has its own rhythm. In the same way that, when, so the point I'm making, if you carry religion to the marketplace, it will come with consequences. And the Catholic Church perhaps has defined this the best, not because we are the best. The boundaries of separation are pretty clear. And the code of canon law which regulates our lives and the life of the church is clear. If I decide today I'm free as a citizen of the Federal Republic of Nigeria to go and pick a ticket and say I want to be governor or I want to be president, nobody will take me to prison, nobody will quarrel with me. However, the day I collect a ticket that I'm going to run under APC, PDP, RRP, SDP, or whatever it is, the Catholic Church will walk to my door and say to me, can you please hand us the keys of the bishop's house in the Diocese of Sokoto and take a walk? Because now I'm a member of a political party. I can no longer, because I can't enter the cathedral of Sokoto. I can only enter because I'm the bishop of Sokoto. I can only enter because the pope, because when you are being ordained as a bishop, even in the ceremony, they will ask you, okay, bishop, so, so you've been, how do we know? that you are not a fraud. The second part of the ceremony is a letter will be read from the Pope saying, I, this is how, this is what has happened. We have appointed Matthew Hassan Kuka to become the bishop. So the Pope will say, give us back our letter, carry your things, the things that belong to you, pack them and leave the house. If I enter the cathedral, I can enter to worship, but I cannot climb the altar. But nobody will take me to court for exercising my right as a citizen. So I'm a citizen of two worlds, but I must understand the sharpness of those boundaries. So my responsibility and the way the Catholic Church teaches us is that we can encourage our people, indoctrinate, teach them the doctrines of public, how managing the public good, and then send them out into public life. Our responsibility is different. Now, I can't speak for the Pentecostal pastors. There are one or two Pentecostal pastors who have run for election. One or two of them who are professor that they will be president, they are still in their churches because they didn't make it. But because their churches are their enterprises, they can keep the key, come back and pick it up. I can't do that as a bishop or as a priest of the Catholic Church. That's how our rules and regulations are. And that's our program for today. We would, of course, love to hear from you on the conversation. Our social media handles are right there on your screen. You can also listen to this and previous episodes of the program via our podcast. Please visit our website, channelstv.com, to get started. I'm Susan Ilian. Goodbye.